Welcome to Like It Is Radio featuring Ladies First. I'm your host, Cheryl Lightford. Always, always a pleasure to be here to connect, have conversations and dialogue. We meet here every single Friday morning right here at KCEP FM 88.1 on your radio dial right here in Las Vegas, Nevada from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. I'm going to say Pacific Standard Time. For those that are uh, listening from another time zone, I want to make sure you guys stay connected. Don't forget, you can always, you can always listen live on power88lv.com. That's power88lv.com. Or if you're traveling or out and about or doing whatever you do, you can always just download the KCEP app and take me with you. However you want to do it. If you're here in Las Vegas, listen live on 88.1. That's FM. If you're, you know, out of state in another place or doing other things and it's more convenient for you to listen online, do that at power88lv.com. Or if you want to just download the KCEP app and take me with you, however you're wanting to do that, however you're choosing to listen is greatly appreciated. I have to admit on Ladies First, we have a good time. Sometimes there's laughter, sometimes it's emotional, and other times we have to have those serious conversations that must be had. We don't always want to talk about things, but we have to. Sometimes they may ruffle some feathers, and that's okay because we can respectfully agree to disagree, but at least you'll get some perspective. It's funny because... And, and, I can hear him right now. So it's funny because the originator of Like It Is Radio, um, of course, I was the softer side of Franklin Burley. Anybody that knew him or listened to him knew that, um, you know, he talked really fast and he was very passionate and compassionate about the community. And, you know, he would always say, you know, sometimes, Cheryl, there's going to be some furniture moving. But we're not moving any furniture. We're not kicking off stools. We're not taking off eyelashes or doing any of that. We're having conversations. And I get the opportunity to have those conversations and bring those conversations to you guys, my Like It Is Radio family, the guests that are unwavering and relentless on their stance when it comes to providing knowledge and valuable information to help us to make educational and informative choices and decisions that impact our lives, our family lives, and the lives of our children, especially black children in the educational system across the country. I'm talking about it today on Ladies First with my guest, Christina Laster. She's an activist, advocate, policy, and legislation strategist. I will introduce her shortly, but I want to say that my guests are intellects that are changing the game. They're innovators, strategic strategists, they're progressive, they're coming with solutions and ideas and putting forth initiatives and legislation. With that being said, let me reintroduce myself. I'm Cheryl Lightford. Thank you guys for connecting with me on Ladies First this morning. So much to talk about. I am honored to be speaking with Christina Laster. She's the National Action Network Western Region Education Director in this in-depth conversation about our black children, especially our black boys in the educational system across the country, how legislation is affecting them um, or lack of legislation is affecting them, not only when they're in school, but also once they graduate and in their adult lives. Some of these charges that our young black boys are being charged with in school that's carrying over to their adult lives. Um, this young lady that I'm speaking with, uh, she's a trailblazing advocate and pioneer dedicated to driving change through codified processes. Miss Christina Laster, welcome to Ladies First. It's an absolute pleasure having you. Thank you for having me. I, I'm looking forward to this conversation um, and for action, right? Uh, you know, a lot of times we have discussions and people think about what next. And so hopefully, uh, during the course of this discussion, people will have something that clicks with their level of knowledge and expertise um, and they are able to go out and make change. 
Absolutely. And before we even um, get into the conversation, I was reading your bio and it would take me two shows to even <laughs> to even talk about all the things that you've done and what you're doing. So why don't you give us a little background about who you are? And first what off, you do. Yeah. So, you know, first of all, I'm a mom, a black mom um, and have four children, three girls, one boy, and I have five grandchildren. Right. And so that's what ultimately drives me to pursue what's right, just, and fair for our children. Because I know as a mom, I want what's right, just, and fair for my children um, and then for their peers. And so I grew up in uh, San Diego, California, born and raised, went on to pursue a, a bachelor's degree in political science and then um, furthered my education and got a master's degree in business administration. Um, but during the course of that time, I worked for um, one of the major school districts in our state. And so I learned a lot about the policies and the practices and the money or the lack thereof um, and the business practices. Um, because if people don't believe that school districts are ran as a business, they might want to check the flow chart again and look at the way that the money um, is administered and, you know, all of the, those things that go into school districts. And so I started to see just, uh, areas of weakness that were harming our children. And I, and I tried to advocate from the inside. Um, but that wasn't effective because people could just say, Oh, you know, we'll consider that next year, but our children needed the solution today, yesterday. Um, and so as a mom and I, and I began to grow my family, um, I decided to, you know, walk away from the school district. I resigned, you know, um, you know, I had about 13 years in, in there and I wanted to really advocate for change in the community. Um, and so at that time I entered my son into school and immediately, immediately I'm talking kindergarten. Um, I noticed that he was targeted. They honed in on him. And because he was bigger than all, all of the other children, for whatever reason, the system saw that as a problem. So instead of educating him, they tried to train him. And that turned into discipline. I mean, training that you need to be still. You can't move over here as normal five-year-olds would do. Right. Um, if the kids were lining up to the door, I remember one incident, the children were lining up to the door and, you know, as kindergartners, five year olds do, they're all running to the door is what the teacher explained to me. Uh, my son ran to the door, but because he was so big, he was knocking children down. Well, instead of them looking at that as a normal childlike behavior and an accident, not something that he was intending to do, they came up with a rule where he the other kids could run but he had to wait you know and so there were consequences that built from there um and me being you know a previous educator and understanding that children and child development i i, I begin to advocate for him but it wasn't effective enough to keep them from punishing him um and seeing him as a problem so i took that advocacy over to civil rights organizations and i and i've been effectively advocating from civil rights organizations for children since. Um, other parents saw that what I was doing as far as the policies and the practices and the legislation was effective. Um, and so we started to form parent groups and parent organizations. Um, and that still wasn't enough, right? It wasn't enough to meet the need that our children had. Um, and so I went from that local level of being a community organizer to the national level of directing organizations around policy and legislation and, you know, uh, volunteering my time to civil rights organizations to help uh, influence their strategies around policy and legislation, all dealing with K-12 education. And that's how I arrived here. Yeah. And you, and so with all of that, you travel um, across the country doing this it's not just in california it's not just las vegas like you travel across the country and you're advocating and 
um, and involved in the legislation and, and the legislation process of all of this. Um, yes. In I Las understand. Vegas, yeah, in, in Vegas, we have the worst school district. We're one of the worst school districts. And with the treatment that we've all heard, it's no secret about how black children are being treated, especially black boys. Are we seeing that across the board? We're seeing that across the nation. Um, I, this year alone, have been to New York, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Washington, D.C., right? And we're what? In June. Just arrived in June. And I was supposed to go to Chicago this week. And we are seeing that across the nation. And, you know, let me just say that it's not something that's new, which is really sad, right? Because when I talk to grandparents around this issue, um, because we understand that this is a generational issue, the first thing that grandparents and, and, and great aunties and uncles say is that's still happening, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, I tell people every time we ask for reform, which I don't really like that word, we get repression. So we're asking the system that essentially codified our oppression from the beginning to now turn and transform or change itself and become something different. And so, you know, that's not, it hasn't been effective. As a matter of fact, the national averages um, in education show that black children have not progressed in over 20 years. I need people to hear that. The national education averages indicate that nationally, that means in Nevada, that means in California, that means in the South, that means in the West, that means in the Midwest, the Northeast, wherever black children are, they have not progressed in over 20 years. I'm flabbergasted. Yeah. Anybody can look it up at NAEP, N-A-E-P. Okay, that's where the national education data is collated. And black children have not made any significant progress, any progress in over 20 years. How can that be? And I'm going to and I'm going to play devil's advocate because you have some other races of people that are going to say, well, that's not the school district's problem. Maybe, you know, maybe the parents need to step in or, you know, it's always an excuse. I would have to believe that if if you can look this up, if you can look this data up, I would have to imagine that other school districts are aware of this. And is there not a concern or they just don't care? I would say it's not this or that. It's all of the above, right? Um, You know, a lot of people try to attribute the data to the parents not caring, but then you're saying that the deficit is in us and our children. And the deficit is not us and our children because our children are um, very bright. They're intelligent and can learn. So if they're not making a phrenological argument, which, you know, that was based on, skull sizes and brain sizes from uh, the study of phrenology, which is supposed to be an outdated and um, invalidated scientific practice, then what are they saying when they blame the parents and the children for the deficit, right? Um, I believe a lot of it is environmental and the school is a hostile environment for our children. If you ask any of them, they will tell you. They will tell you um, that it is a hostile environment and that they recognize by a certain age the bias, that there are other children that can um, act like children um, and are expected to do so, childlike behaviors along the lines of child development. But when our Black boys and girls do that, they're penalized for it um, because they are expected to act as adults, Okay. So part of that is a, is the social um, and environmental components of education. Another question is, <clears throat> you know, why is it that all of the charts, indicators for the school to prison pipeline show black boys at the top, the number one punished, excluded, and we're talking about harsh, excessive exclusionary practices. They spend more time in suspension. Less time in class. 
underneath uh, black boys would be black girls. Okay. And underneath black girls would be all other demographics of boys. So I want people to think about that. Black girls are um, receiving excessive and exclusionary punishment at a rate higher than all other demographics of boys, except for black boys. Mm. Okay. And that's how you can kind of view the order on the school to prison pipeline. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if I had the answer to um, what is the cause of this, some of it's environmental, some of it is bias, so outright what we call invidious discrimination. You know, I, I deal with districts where children are uh, being called out of their name um, be, for being black, you know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. ostracized, intimidated, bullied, threatened. How is that not racial hate speech? You know, mm-hmm. how is it not? How is it not considered that? How are schools not approaching um, these anti-discrimination policies from the perspective of zero tolerance practices? Because I'll tell you what, if our children are in class and they can't be still and they're talking out of turn, it's zero tolerance for them, three strikes and you're out. But when they're being called out of their name, bullied, harassed, intimidated, targeted, mistreated, um, overlooked often. The quiet ones get overlooked and neglected. They can just sit in the back of the classroom and be forgotten about, right? There, those things are not treated from the perspective of zero tolerance. Mm-hmm. And those are all contributing factors to what I consider hinders the progress, um, of our children. Um, because by third grade, most of our children recognize they're in an, uh, uh, unwanted environment. Mm hmm. Yeah. I've talked to several parents um, who have said basically what you just said, that their black children, especially their black sons, cannot go to school and be black boys in elementary school. Mm-hmm. They, they, they're not allowed to be white. White kids can be white boys. The white boys, can, they can have, you know, um, do what boys do, have childlike behavior. But right. black boys are hold at a higher standard, almost have to be a young adult in elementary school uh-huh. because of the color of their skin. Which is preposterous, but it happens, right? And anyone that tries to pretend to be colorblind should check out a study on um, how quickly babies are able to recognize skin color. Because I'll tell you that they are, Right. And so, you know, we have to have real discussions about what's happening. And those people that consider themselves our allies need to be willing to speak up as well. Right. I did have some allies when my when my son um, was being mistreated and they went to the school district and said, look, my child is experiencing nightmares based on the treatment of the teacher to another child you guys need to step in and stop this and the school district told them to mind their own business mm-hmm. oh i believe it mm-hmm. I, I i believe it i could i could share stories with my daughter right mm-hmm. here in the clark county school district where honestly finally i had to go to the principal and just say you know what at this point my daughter has the right to defend herself by any means necessary call me afterwards right Be- I couldn't take it no more because you're allowing these kids to call her bad names, to antagonize her, to do all of this. And we're doing what we're supposed to do. Okay, go to the teacher, go to the principal, you know, follow the line of order. Right. But nothing is being done. But the minute I say, okay, now she has the right to defend herself. Well, we can't allow that. Well, She has the right at this point to defend herself. And when she did defend herself, because one of the little white boys Uh called her a black A N B I T C H. And she let him have it. And then they called. But the cold thing about it is when they put it in her report, they did not say 
what he said. They made it seem like she was just an angry kid. So if someone were to read that, they would think, oh, she has anger issues. Because they did not put in there what the little boy said to her. That would make a difference. Then someone reading it could say, oh, I can understand her acting the way that, you know, reacting the way that she did. She's a child, right? But they didn't put it in there. I made them put it in there. I made them. No, you're going to put in there why. Right. It's almost like they were excusing his behavior, but not excusing her behavior. Well, his actions led to her behavior. Clearly. But you are. Yes. Yeah. And so I'm going to offer a solution in this moment about school records. Okay, Um, and those of you that are listening can look this up, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And I want you to look at the U.S. Department of Education's, um, you know, publication on this. And so under the U.S. Code, Title 20, Section 1232G, 34 CFR, we're looking at the Code of Federal Federal Regulations, Part 99, you are protected around privacy of your students' records and under those rules, you have the right to inspect and review your students' records that are maintained by the school, okay? That means if you walk in to the office and you say, look, under FERPA, I want to review my child's records. I want to make sure they're accurate. I want to make sure they're up to date. I want to see those behavior records. I want to see the nurse's records. Then they cannot deny you. And if they do, you need to take that to the U.S. Department of Education. All right. So I want you guys to have a solution when stuff like that happens so that you're operating. Um, when, when we're talking about a system of codification or codified rules, rules that are in writing, rules that are in black and white, oral tradition doesn't work well there. Right. They see that as, oh, now the mom is upset or the mom is in style. Or because she's angry. To, uh-huh. Right. Angry. Look at the angry black mom who wants to come in and argue with us. But if I come in and say, I have the right to inspect and review my child's re- records under FERPA. And if you deny me that right, I wanted you to put it in writing. Thank you. Okay. And allow them that opportunity to respond. Um, now you're speaking the language that the system codified understands. And mm-hmm. they can either accept it or reject it, right? So I want you to have that power in your hands right now. Any of you that believe that your child's records are inaccurate, you need to ask to review them. And anything that needs to be corrected, you need to state your FERPA rights for those corrections. Now, I've had to do this with 504s and IEPs because the way that they identified um you know, a child's uh, behaviors based on their diagnosis painted the picture that they were criminals mm-hmm. or some there kind of various actors. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go for the, for, for prisons. That's why they're building prisons. It's mm-hmm. a big money business. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's something that we're not taught growing up. Like here's your codified request. Here is your legal rights to do this, right? We feel and experience that we have it, but we don't have the terminology. And so what I try to do is equip people with the terminology that they need to actually exercise their rights, right? Um, and, and to continue to do that. So I just wanted to offer that solution right then in that moment so that people walk away with an action. Yeah. Mm hmm. And don't you think that it's important that we check our children's record often, especially after an incident? Absolutely. To make sure what they wrote in there is correct. Because what they write, they understand it. If someone goes back two weeks from now, someone different, read it. They're going to read it totally different because they're not going to know everything that transpired if not all the information was put in there. Absolutely. Right. Um, there's also a part of the code, you know, that deals with the protection of pupils rights. Right. It's called PPRA, the Protection of Pupils Rights Amendment. You have to understand what that means for the records, because these records are important um, and they're being held electronically a lot of times. Right. 
And so you want to make sure that you understand um, what the rules are around your rights as a, a parent and then your child's rights as the pupil and those school records. Those that's mm -hmm. It's vital to know. You don't want people keeping records that are inaccurate and inaccurately depict your child, right? Mm -hmm. Those can ter be turned over to uh, law enforcement really quickly um, or child protective services, right? Um, and if that picture is already painted that your, your child is a troubled child or a behavioral problem or X, Y, Z going down the list, what do you mm -hmm. think that other agency is going to do? They're going to continue that trajectory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and with that being said, and I'm glad that you, you talked about that because that made me think about this and I don't know if I'm going to say it, you know, it, it's in my head on how I want to say it. So I hope that you understand it. But with what you're saying, it sounds like there are different education systems, right? That affect, that affect black families such as families that are on welfare, families who, whose children do have the, what do you call them? I, I, IEPs and 504s. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, um, that are, then they're affected by the penal system and all those systems. We are resources for those systems. They're getting, Absolutely. they're getting money. Absolutely. I mean, they're getting money for that. There is a nexus that exists between school codes or education codes and penal codes, okay? Um, and then child welfare or, you know, I try to say so-called child welfare um, services. And it, a lot of parents that I'm helping are dealing with all of those agencies at one time. Right, right. I mean, that's they from have, something that happened at school. Yes, from something that originated at school. Okay, I'm starting to see an influx in that. And what that does is put a parent in, in this codified web of confusion that now they're trying to then defend them and their child against and, and pull apart or, or try to figure out what next, right? What next? Um, it, it's a lot. I, I, I have seen an uptick in middle schoolers with IEPs getting criminal charges for childlike behavior, talking 11 year olds, 11 year olds, right? Um, and it's also, it, it makes me look at it like I'm looking at what is written about this child and I'm like, are we talking about a, an 11 year old? Or are you setting this 11 year old up for a future life sentence? Because to say these things about 11 year old is to negate their development and understanding and reasoning, knowing that their frontal lobes aren't fully developed. I mean, at 11, you're probably just tapping on the door of puberty, right? Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so it makes me really uh, think about the intention behind all of it. And, and if you ask your grandparents or your great grandparents, they'll tell you what it is because they've experienced this nefarious discrimination, invidious hatred, some form or another, and it just keeps on recreating and reproducing itself. Um, and right now, it's against our children. Yeah. And when we're talking about some of these charges, let's be real and let's be honest. We're we're talking rape charges that they're trying to put on eleven on eleven year old, twelve year old black boys, and all they're doing is being kids, right? Doing the same thing that other white kids are doing, being being kids, being boys. But right. they're not being ostracized like black boys are being ostracized. Right. I um I had a parent a month ago who I was helping and then I had to um ultimately um advise her to seek legal counsel. Um her son went to school, eleven years old, sixth grader, they're playing uh handball. Okay. Just like kids do, they're getting into an argument at the handball court. You know, I mean, it's my turn. No, it's my turn. You won, you lost. No, it, you know, all of that stuff that happens on, on playgrounds. The little girl, she didn't like the fact that she lost and she had to give up her spot. And, um, you know, so they end up having a tussle over the ball. The little girl goes home and tells her parents that the 
black boy was spilling on her butt. Instead of saying, we're tussling over this ball and we're both being physical with each other. She made it seem like the boy was just spilling on all over her body, right? Um, and so law enforcement was called, CPS was contacted, and the community that the little girl lived in came out to the school to look for this little boy as if he was some kind of um, child pedo- you know, molester or something, right? Mm-hmm. And they were seeking to harm him. And the school called the parents and said, you can't bring them because we can't keep them safe. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you can have a physical altercation just like children do. Siblings have it all the time. Boys and girls, you know, I mean, they're 11. And you guys can be struggling over a ball. The the child that loses can make up anything. And without evidence, now this little boy's life is at stake. Mm -hmm. Uh, Law enforcement gets involved. Um, Ultimately, the school says we have to expel him, um, you know, based on sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. Where's his due process, right? Mm -hmm. Where's his ability to have, you know, evidence produced and brought forward? Um, But because all of the other students in the community got together um, and sided with the little girl, it became a big deal and they just wanted to get rid of the problem and they saw him as the problem and not the fact that they were being children and this escalated in those little quote unquote white lies that um, essentially got him expelled and law enforcement contact and CPS child protective services contact 11 years old. Now, Mm. how do you clear your record from that? Right. Mm. You guys, you better pull up and pull close for this conversation because it's, it's, I mean, how many of us have children or nieces or nephews or cousins or grandchildren that are in, that are in the schools that are in school districts across the nation? You know, um, you know, it's bad enough we worry about our children outside of a school and we just worry about our children as parents because that's what we do. But we have to worry about them in school. Uh huh. Yeah, because it's a hostile environment for our children. And so, you know, we have to really consider. What becomes toxic to our children's health. I'm not just talking if, if anybody wants to review a report on that, they can review a health report from 2019 from the American Academy of Pediatrics, and it's called the Impact of Racism on Child and Adolescent Health. And they talk about the acute health symptoms that our children face from just being in a biased, discriminatory, and hostile environment where they're pulling their hair out, biting their nails, not wanting to go to school. They're, they're saying that they're sick in the morning. Now, how many of you is this resonating with? Are, are this resonating with, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mommy, I have an upset stomach because at first grade, second grade, third grade, you're ex- internalizing all of this violence. I call it mental violence, spiritual violence, physical violence, even when you're getting bullied and don't really know how to externalize what's happening and don't know how to defend yourself and advocate for yourself. And everywhere you turn, you don't have someone that's, you know, on your side. Right. And so the American Academy of Pediatrics put that policy statement out in 2019 and it has a ton of uh, research and data about the health symptoms that our children um, show display um, when they're subjected to these types of situations and environments. And most now, of those were documented from the education system. Okay, so now, Christina, I'm just going to be honest with you. It's going to be some people that's listening to this conversation that we're having, and they're saying, you know, racism in school, that, that's all made up. Well, how they're part you, of the how problem. How you answer that? Yeah, they're part of, they're, they are part of the problem. Right. Um, I have the tendency to believe the children and little children do not have to make up 
um, you know, that these things are happening to them. Um, and if you believe that you live in the United States of America, which was founded upon the principles of racial violence and colonial settler, settler uh, ism, and that these things are not still being perpetuated through the systems and the structures where we haven't abolished them from. Because somebody tell me at which date did we eradicate these practices? Just because they're not called, let's be racist against the black children, doesn't mean that they don't exist, right? Um, and so I think that you have to challenge your own mentality if you care about the safety and well-being of all children. Because the people will say, well, we care about all children. Why are you guys bringing up this racial impact stuff, right? Well, aren't black children a part of all? And if they were, then how come they haven't been treated that way? And how come every single component of the data indicates that from medical data and research to uh, education data and research to, you know, school assessments and performance um, evaluations shows that they are in distress. And if you turn a blind eye to that, then you're part of the problem and you're helping to uphold the system that is mistreating and harming our children. And mm -hmm. I just got to call it what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, I mean, if there was no re racism, then there would be no need for legislation, correct? Protection or initiatives. There would be no need for any of that, right? I'm going to repeat what Malcolm X said. If we were actually citizens, why would we be fighting for our rights? Isn't that supposed to be automatic, right? You know, a citizen of a place that's born in a place um, should automatically have the rights and privileges and guarantees of that governance structure be sold on them. But why are we still fighting for the right to protection? Why are we still fighting to be um, in, a, in environments free of invidious discrimination and hate? Um, you know, these things tend to rear their ugly heads when there's some kind of uh, brutality and police brutality issue and the whole world gets to see it. But this is violence happening to our children every day in different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we can't wait, you know. How does this continue? How how does the systematic racism in the district, when the parents see it, uh, the teachers have to see it? Like you said, you can't turn a blind a blind eye to it. How how I, I just don't understand. Like how how can it continue? How does it continue when it's brought to their attention? to the school district's attention all the time. They know what they're doing or do they not know? Well, I mean, that's part of a system function, right? Especially if it moves from organic to institutionalized, right? Because you no longer have these, um, you know, living and breathing and changing and, you know, dynamic flex ability types of, of mechanisms. You have what's there, and we've been doing it this way for 20 years, 10 years. Don't come over here trying to tell us to change. Um, uh, you know, we're going to trickle the, the faucet real slow. The water's dripping on the equity. We don't even want to hear that word. And so they start attacking the words. They start attacking the policies. And it continues because you have people that are knowledgeable about it happening. And then you have those people that say it can't be that bad and are upholding these practices in their, mm -hmm. I, well, it, it's probably a little bit, but it can't be that bad, right? Everyone is playing an active role. There's no innocent bystander when it comes to children being mistreated, harmed, and that being indicated in their um, achievement, in their performance, in their medical, you know, um, issues, um, in their mental health issues. There aren't any innocent bystanders. So once you no longer see yourself as an innocent bystander and you start to see yourself as part of um, the behavior of society, as part of the, um, you know, influence of whether or not you speak up or not, then you will be able to look a little bit deeper and look past your own scotoma or bias um, and look at the heart of the problem. Like children 
are telling adults what's happening to them, right? We can't overlook it. And as parents, we can't be afraid that if we speak up, we're going to be retaliated against because then what are we teaching our children? We're teaching them to be silent and just deal with it and move on the, the next day and then the next day and then the next day. And then when does that cycle ever end? Mm -hmm. Right. So this mm -hmm. era in, in this information calls for, for courageous action, right? It calls for bold introspection and intervention. And, and we all have to be willing to say, having a conversation around disparities, not okay. When do we normalize that? Having a conversation about people being disenfranchised, marginalized, uh, mistreated, should it be because we should never normalize having those types of discussions? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't like sitting in a room where we're just talking about disparities. Why is that okay? On any given day of the week that we're having a discussion solely based on racial disparities. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we got to be the change we want to see. And I know that it requires boldness. And I know that our sheer numbers alone are not going to be what produces that because we dynamically understand the problem. It's like preaching to the choir, but it's those people that are thinking that they're innocent bystanders that really need to challenge their own thought processes and behavior. Yeah. It, when I tell you uh, this conversation, we can continue to have again and again and again. It is just so much to talk about, so much to cover. But I do want to say this. Um, I know that you are nationally recognized, um, for your knowledgeable and experienced policy and legislation, uh, st strategist that you are. You have been given the nickname Queen of Qualification. Um, you have been very active and vocal in a number of things. I know that there's a, um, a law in California that aims to keep children safe from extreme weather conditions during physical activities. I know you're a part of that. I want you to elaborate on what that is. Also, I know that you led the Justice for Journey campaign out of Michigan um, uh, that dealt with the Crown Act. Um, you have so much that you do. Let's talk about a little bit of the activism um, that you that, that you've done and that you're doing? Yeah, sure. So I'll start with the California issue since it's the most recent. Um, there was a 12-year-old black boy by the name of Yeshua who, um, as the other children, um, were made to run during PE and it was around 95 degrees outside, okay? Um, an ex excessive heat warning went out Days before that day of school. So why the PE coach decided to allow the middle school children to go outside and run it during, you know, a hot day in an excessive heat, um, uh, an excessive heat warning is beyond me. <laughs> Yeshua actually ended up collapsing and dying. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, that could have been prevented, you know, and I started to look at if school districts across the state had policies or practices in place with regards to extreme weather conditions and excessive heat warnings. Um, and was that uniform? Because we know even the military has that, right? Mm -hmm. um, you are in the military. There's a, a, a time where it's if it's hot, you're going to call it. You're not going to be outside running. And what we do know also is that during that same week of excessive heat warnings, there were pro athlete marathon runners who postponed their marathon because they knew it was going to be too hot to run. So what made it okay for children to be outside doing PE? So I took the um, information that I found and what I found was that scientists and doctors had been raising all kinds of red flags about children succumbing to extreme weather conditions and especially heat. Um, there was a changing heat index that we weren't really paying much attention to as far as on the educational side. And it took this for me to then go to the legislator and say, we have to protect the children from um, unforeseen and extreme weather events, Okay, whether it's too cold or whether it's too hot. We need to have mm -hmm. some type of uniform policy guidelines and practices in place 
What happens if a child collapses? What do you do next, right? Um, I see firefighters and um, EMTs training for that type of situation, but do educators know that? Do, is there enough ice to, you know, help in that moment, right? Um, will 911 come, come quick enough um, or will the ch child succumb to the heat like Yeshua did? And so I got with the legislator and, you know, we created this bill out of the necessity to protect children, but out of the legacy of Yeshua's 12 years of life that he did leave. And one of the, the statements or phrases that he liked to say a lot was, I am him. And so I said, let's bring that to the forefront because it humanizes this law because we are the children. We need to be understanding from their perspective the, the types of safety that they need. No child should be made to run outside in 95 degree heat. Yes. Yes. And then Journey, let's talk about her. So Journey Hoffmeyer um, was a situation that actually made worldwide news. And um, she was a little seven-year-old girl that was at school in Michigan in Mount Pleasant. Um, and the librarian cut her hair off at school. Okay. Uh, okay, what? Yeah. So okay. the librarian cut off Journey Hoffmeyer's hair at school. Um, Journey Hoffmeyer ended up coming home to dad uh, the day before spring break, you know, um, and he's panicking, like, what happened to your hair? You know, and so... Her hair was really long and, and, and it was blonde, gold, curly locks and, um, you know, curly, really curly and all the way down her back. She had grew that hair her whole life. And now it was about maybe an inch long. She shared Journey off my hair like a sheep. Okay. Ooh, okay. Without her parents' permission. Without her parents' permission. She took permission. it up on herself to yeah. cut the little girl's hair. Why? Yeah. Because she saw Journey Hoffmeyer's hair as a problem to be dealt with. And she felt like she had that authority to be the one to deal with it. And so there we go again with the cultural um, bias about hair, right? And so Journey is a mixed child, beautiful hair she had um, in the in the library and cut it off. She didn't ask permission. She didn't even contact the parents. Um, nothing would have told her to do that besides her own wants, needs, and desires. Because she mm -hmm. asked Journey, did she want to look prettier like the other girls? And then cut her hair off. Okay. So that ended um, in the dad. He he was reaching out to the school. Nobody wanted to answer him. You know, they were kind of condescending and arrogant, saying that, you know, we're on spring break. Deal, we'll deal with this when we get back. But he's, like, very upset because his daughter's hair got cut off. Right. Mm -hmm. So he ends up looking online um, for an activist or an advocate that can help him. And he finds me, reaches out to me on uh, social media, and um, I get into action right away. Ultimately, that ended in a $1.4 million lawsuit um, and an undisclosed settlement amount. And um, then the Michigan governor taking very seriously, um, after all of that attention, that there needed to be a Crown Act. And I'm glad that that happened because... There were people in um, various municipalities like around Michigan who were saying we need a crown act here and it couldn't pass. And then mm -hmm. ultimately Journey Hoffmeyer sparked that revolution that was necessary um, for people to realize that they did need some levels of protection. And the, so that protection is extended to school aged children. And and <laughs> I'm going to say this and then I definitely have to ask you about your affiliation with something else. But. Isn't it sad that we have to have the Crown Act to protect our hair? Are you serious? Yeah, I mean, I first of all, a school is not a, a licensed uh, facility to cut hair. Everybody mm -hmm. that you know works at the school knows they're not supposed to be cutting children's hair. You can't even tell me that there was good intentions behind this, right? Yeah. Um, I worked in education and, and children had lice, they had gum in their hair, all kinds of stuff. And you know what? We couldn't touch it. You know, mm -hmm. it was like, OK, if you have lice, we have to send you to the nurse. You have gum in your hair. We have to notify the parents that there's gum. You know, that's it. You can't mm -hmm. cut it off. Right. right? Um, yeah. But that wasn't what she did. She asked Journey if she wanted to be prettier like the other girls. Wow. wow. And cut her hair off. And so. I, I don't know, um, you know, 
we have to just start seeing things for what, what they, they are. And yeah. to me, that was straight wicked. That's oh, what it I was. Said. It was. And so, but I really quickly, because we don't have too much time left, I want to, uh, I want you to, um, talk to us and tell us your affiliation with the White House Initiative on Advancing Educational Equity, Excellence, and Economic Opportunity for Black Americans through the U.S. Department of Education. Absolutely. So I have been a stakeholder, um, collaborating with the White House Initiative team from the time that they had had a team. And so in October 21, I mean, 2021 of October, um, Biden signed the executive order for advancing equity and opportunity for black Americans. Okay. And that is essentially um, a policy and practice type of, of initiative. There was a prior order um, that this order essentially uh, rescinded and now this order is in effect and the only in the only other order we had like this was during Obama and then the black cabinet that was way long time ago part of the Roosevelt's and um you know that that was something that was the only time in history that we've had that so I collaborate with them around the policy initiatives um looking for ways to dynamically um change the condition of our children and then how to empower communities to fight for those types of things that they need to reduce some of the um, disparities that I hate talking about so much. Right. Mm -hmm. And so anybody that wants to look and see that order should definitely look it up. If you've never even heard about it, a lot of people have never even heard about it um, and see what the policies are, the, the vital policies and programs that the Biden administration have put out. And there is a fact sheet that you can look at from February 27, 2023 around um, what they've done so far. And so part of the work that I've done with them is um, creating Know Your Rights sessions with the Office for Civil Rights so that people can understand how to file those complaints when they believe they've experienced discrimination um, in schools or either with their IEP process. Um, so we did those types of sessions and then another one around community schools so that people know how to um, partner with their district and their local communities to really make sure that community schools are the best that they can possibly be and that there's that stakeholder engagement um, and other projects that we have upcoming. We have something coming up on um, the last week of June with regards to the commemoration of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which will be turning 60 years old this year on July 2nd. And so there's a lot of things that um, we've collaborated to do um, in making sure Black families were involved and engaged and at the focal point of the work around the policy changes. Yeah, yeah. And then really quickly, I have to ask you about this. So what what are your ties with NAN, the National Action Network and uh, LaBaspe, Las Vegas Alliance of Black School Educators with Kamala Bywaters and Tracy Lewis? I love Kamala and Tracy. Yes. Shout out to Kamala and Tracy. Um, listen. So when I um, first got appointed into this position as the Western Regional Education Director, um, I started to put together a team and Tracy and Camila were right there all along the way, looking at the policies, looking at the practices, looking at our condition, trying to figure out solutions. What is our agenda going to be? And so they have been vital to the success of many of the things that I talked about, even with the White House initiative um, collaboration that we've done too. And they, I mean, they're just, them is my girls right there. I got to say that. So I have to put in a little plug. Um, but yeah, Labatsi is, is big in advocacy and intervening on behalf of our children. And I know that their heart is to see the change and to be the change, right? Yeah. To be the change. Yeah. Yeah. They are strategic. They're passionate. They're unwavering and definitely relentless. And when I tell you, uh, those ladies, they are on it and they are yes. not playing about, they are not playing about the children. They <laughs> like, are they not are playing. Not, no, they are not. They will call right, right and wrong, wrong. <laughs> yes. And so that's how I know that they speak my love language, which is justice. Right. So, like, Absolutely. Let's go. Absolutely. 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 Amazing.
And so yeah. that's, you know, they, they were um, part of education for the Nevada NAN, and that's how we met. And ever since I've met them, they've been consistent with their advocacy, serious about their advocacy, and will do whatever they can to yeah. make sure that our children have was fair, it was right, and was just. Absolutely. You guys, I am uh, speaking with Christina Laster. She's the National Action Network Western Region Educational Direct Education Director. It has been, when I tell you, this has been an extremely informative conversation. It, it, uh, when I tell you this conversation has resonated with so many parents and have really given them a different perspective on how to handle things and how to be more um, active with their children in school to check their records, you know, just, just everything. Um, you, you know, thank you for, for all your Herculean efforts and everything that you do for the passion for just for the everything. Now, I'm sure I have a bunch of parents that are like, okay, if we needed to get in contact with her, how can we do that? Can you give us any information? Yeah, so they can reach out to either Lavapsi or Nan, right, um, right there in um, Las Vegas and let them know that they want to connect with me. Um, I think that that would be the best way. Other than that, they can look me up on my social medias, right? I mean, that's how a lot of parents find me, believe it or not, um, through social media. So it would be 365 Wise, W-I-S-E on Instagram um, and Wise Society um, on TikTok. Right. Um, and then it's it's going to be, you know, look my name up on um, Facebook and you'll find me. I'm on LinkedIn, too. So, you know, um, just search, search for me and you will find me. And um, yeah, let's connect. And I'll have a lot of my know your rights information on my pages. So parents can look at the videos and different things to know their rights. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to have a conversation with me on Ladies First. We're going to definitely have to get it, um, have to have another conversation. There's something that I definitely want to talk to you about in the future. I think us talking about our history is Absolutely. something, you know, is something that we definitely need to talk about. So with that being said, I want you to enjoy the rest of your day. And again, thank you. And I will stay in contact with you. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Hey, you guys have a wonderful weekend. Be safe. Be safe. Be safe. Be safe. Until next week, you guys, enjoy. Love y'all. Bye.